Welcome to the spoiler cast for Rehydrate. As a warning, this episode will contain spoilers for all of the Three Body Problem, The Dark Forest, and Death Send. If you don't want to be spoiled on future events, please skip this episode. This is Season 5, Episode 5, Fate's Choice, where we will be discussing the second half of Part 3 and all of Part 4 of Death's End by Liu Sushin. My name is Talia, and I have read all three of these books. This is Amin, and I've only read up to the current week's reading, but also I like spoilers, so I'm here to let Talia and Dan ruin the rest of the series for me. Hey, and this is Dan, and I read the entire series. I mentioned this on the main show, but I want to give a reminder that we are currently and planning for season six of Rehydrate, which will be covering the Foundation Trilogy by Isaac Asimov. The reading list is now up on the website, so if you'd like to read along, you should do that, and you should listen, and hopefully everyone will enjoy it. Let's jump into the summary for this episode. Given new perspective on the fairy tales, humanity discovers curvature propulsion and the idea of the Black Domain. After a catastrophic false alarm and discovery of lines left behind by curvature propulsion, humanity outlaws lightspeed research. Wade re-enters the story when he and Chung Chi become observers to a live demonstration of the Bunker Project. She decides that he is the one to push forward lightspeed research. He does, but at the cost of nearly killing millions of people, Chung Chin shuts down the research and enters hibernation once more. Yeah, so in this episode and in this segment of the book, we see that while they do have new perspective on the fairy tales that we covered in the last part, they decide for their own reasons that those are very dangerous ideas and public opinion starts to turn towards the Bunker Project. And bunkers are nothing new in science fiction, especially. As I was reading or rereading this, I was reminded of the Silo series, which begins with a very short story called Wool. And that, again, has humanity planning for bunkers, planning for a deadly world. And while it's a very entertaining and very quick read, uh, I would even say it's darker implications than the bunker world expressed in Three Body, because in Silo, the conditions of bunker living are further complicated because there's information suppression. So there are separate bunkers that are not equal. Mm-hmm. And as we see in these bunkers, yeah, they seem to have mostly similar living conditions. There are more prosperous ones. There are destitute ones. But it's nothing like the bunkers expressed in Silo where The IT bunker is the only one with advanced tech. Their bunkers are sunk deep into the earth and they're long cylindrical silos. And they're the only ones with elevators. And everyone else has stairs, which severely limits their worldview and their ability to travel and the social dynamics. So that's a good, fun read. But be warned, it is even darker than what we're reading right now. What's the reason for the disparity between the, the bunkers? What's the reason for any social inequality? Oh, okay. So I mean, like this this one, is, yeah, this one is more, yeah, a class statement, I think. But you know, they talk about like the the we're all like the unemployed and and poor people go. So it's the same thing for for this book too. That's true, but there's also this you know information suppression. I think the people who are living in uh, this super destitute world full of homeless people throwing up, like mm-hmm. they know that they're not in the best situation. Yeah. I'm not sure if that's a <laughs> satisfactory answer. But it's a very yeah, satisfying yeah. read. Did I, either of you watch the movie Elysium with uh, Matt Damon and Jodie Foster? That came out, oh gosh, I don't know, six or seven years ago. I'm going to get the number wrong. No, I didn't see it. Oh, so Not so me. that so that's an interesting conceit as well, where the wealthy people uh, on the planet they create a basically a space station that they can all live in and it's interesting opulent and nice and then matt damon the rest of the people are stuck on earth and they have um they basically live in shacks made out of um corrugated metal and things like that so it's it's also um it's not really a bunker per se but it is this whole idea of of classes determining where people get to live and that's also science fictiony it's it's a good movie it's not a great movie but if you have a couple hours to kill it's worth watching yeah it definitely talks about stratification of society and the really the main complaint i had in this segment of the book is i really rolled my eyes when liu sushin through chung shin's voice is saying you know she's seeing the bunkers and she's saying oh 
like by moving to the bunkers, we've eliminated much of the social progress bought by technology. And I just feel like the assumption that with more technological process progress, you get more social progress and you solve social problems. Like that was more science fiction than anything that we read. So I rolled my eyes a little bit at that, but otherwise I really liked this segment. Yeah. I, I do think, I do think all of this was really interesting. I think the sociological aspects of it could have been explored a little bit more. I know, I know that's not what this book is about and we're trying to, trying to wrap this up, but I do think, I do think that I'm interested in that aspect of these types of things is, you know, mm. one, how does society get there? And then two, what do they do when they get there? Like, what do people do for a job? Are they commuting to an office or is everyone just idle and, or, yeah, you know, just things like that. that. Explored more. Absolutely. It would really like flesh out that view. Didn't they talk about like some of the people commuting on bicycles and there weren't, there weren't that many cars on, on one of the world on the, maybe it was in the halo world. Yeah. But they never said where they were going. Where are they going yeah. to? Where are they coming right. from? <laughs> Yeah, but there's a bunch of buildings there. Presumably, yeah, like they're and they they have like the that what was like the world sense, right? They're really trying to like rebuild the world. Uh, yeah, as you remember, they have like the the blue sky there. They have the suns there, and they're trying to make it really like as much like Earth as possible. So presumably, they have yeah, jobs and they're I doing did something. I like that, and like the considerations that the author pours into that, like we have a couple of expensive marketing plots. Like it's not really necessary to have this live demo but it's essential for PR and it's probably not essential for life to have a blue sky. You need oxygen, but for expensive PR and to make people not depressed, um, you have a blue sky. So that I really agree was well done, but I I think Amin has a point where we could have, you know, lived with this world a little bit and saw what it would be like to live here, regardless of where you were in the social class. I wonder what the the line is, though. You know, like people will probably complain that it's just like kind of wheel spinning. You know, if they're just like looking at these different worlds, and you know, they want to get back to the plot. So I think I've thought this many times throughout this this series. Like, oh, this would make a great side story. This would make a great side story. This would also make <laughs> make another great side story of just like living in the bunker world, right? Mm, that's true. It's pretty interesting how he kind of ratcheted up the social commentary, uh, especially around the the uh, the false alarm and the. And the bunker world, like all in the same kind of section. I don't remember in the same part or whatever, but they're close to each other enough, right? It seems like he had like some thought in his head, like, oh, I need to really like maybe like something piqued his interest in you know, what's happening in the in the current world, where he like ratcheted up the, the social commentary a little bit more than he usually does. So the destitute world that we were talking about is actually described in some detail. As they left the floating city in eternal night, Chung Xin gazed at it through the porthole of the dinghy. This was a city of poverty and homelessness, but it also possessed its own rich life, like a weightless version of the famous Song Dynasty painting along the river during the Qingming Festival. So if you're like myself or Dan, you probably are not familiar with these words all put together, along the river during the Qingming Festival, especially to um, an American reader, is not as significant. So I actually needed further context to really impress on me why Qingming Shanghotu is being talked about in this modern science fiction book. And that's because the this painting is like more famous than the Mona Lisa. It is, or at least equivalent, and it's still very alive in uh, modern Chinese tradition. So as evidence to that, they actually created an updated version of this painting, Qingming Shanghotu, in Shanghai, and it was projected along a wall. It was at least 10 feet tall or more, and the original is 10 centimeters tall. Mm. So imagine the scale of this update. It ran the length of a whole building. And the way that they did this projection is they had a three-dimensionality to it because it ripples in and out. And you're kept away from the projection by a railing. And the way they shone the light made it seem as if you were on the opposite bank of a river, and this city was in front of you. And it was a celebration or a callback or an homage to the Chinese tradition and also sort of a cheeky way of showing that Shanghai was a great city of the present, just as the capital was during the Song Dynasty. So again, this is another example of a massive idea in miniature as a PR stunt. Mm. The massive idea of the bunker world, creating a whole new world away from the earth 
in miniature is demonstrated with like blowing up an asteroid and showing a safe person behind it. And the massive uh, Qingming festival was shown in miniature mm-hmm. just to remind people we can do PR. We are the great festival. We're worth banking on because creating the bunker world is incredibly expensive and incredibly, you know, politically difficult to pull off. So this is working as PR towards it. There's an animated version of what I described in the show notes for this episode. Yeah, that's a, that's a really cool analogy. I mean, I, when I, I, I didn't remember the name of this one. I mean, I looked at it, it seemed familiar. I don't know if I've seen it. I don't know like if it's like being, it was presented in a museum or something in, in China. I don't know, have, have you seen it in person? I've never seen it in person. I'm not even sure where it's displayed, but once again, like it's incredible. And I've studied it in class, blown up. It is only 10 centimeters tall. Yeah, that's so, not, I, I didn't realize it was that small. <laughs> it's, in, it's an incredibly long scroll, but you would need a long time to work your way across it if it's presented at its original size. So I think that's why they created this updated version in Shanghai. Mm. When I, when I read this uh, originally in the book, I you know, went to Wikipedia and like looked at it, and I was like, I was amazed like how long it was and how detailed it was. I had- it really is incredible. I wanted to also mention just here, there's so many things I loved about the main show episode last week. That's season five, episode five, Fate's Choice. Um, we can talk more about it, but I really thought it was such a fun episode, especially when you mentioned that even at the end of the world, you can't escape tech interviews. Like... <laughs> I paused to just like cackle. That was so true. The worst behavior. I think you described it. (laughs) Yeah, let's let's talk about that. So I actually had a question for you, Talia, if you've had questions like that, because like when I read this part, it immediately struck out, it stuck out to me as like, I have heard these kind of questions in interviews before. And so like, it's just kind of funny. Like I just like imagine the assistant is like, you know, kind of putting it in there is like (laughs) something he is also annoyed with. So I mean, does your job function require those kind of brain teaser questions? If the recruiters for Quantum Black are listening to this, (laughs) please stop. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah, so my experience with tech interviews is brief, uh, nasty, brutish, and short. In fact, Mm. I have taken them. They're awful. You really don't want your life or death to be (laughs) based Uh. on this. Oh, man, I think I was like, taking three books from an infinite library and I had some relationship between, I can't even get into it. Yeah. It's all, yeah. It's always those questions that have no meaning. And like, they're like, what well, does want to see your thought process? But they actually want to know if you just memorize them <laughs> because there's some website out there that has all the answers to all of them. Yeah. I, I just this. thought that was a screaming good analogy. And I'm just remembering like, these are like school children or whatever. And that's yeah. what <laughs> you feel like if you're in a tech interview and someone's asking you a riddle, that has no like perfect answer. You really feel like a school child again. So it's just yeah. <laughs> perfect and unfair. And that's part of the catastrophe of the false alarm, right? Yeah. I mean, I think it's meant to portray like a, a just pying of being, she's a, you know, she's a ruthless CEO who has like a tech background. Yeah, <laughs> so right. she's like, uh, I need to figure out a way to, you know, sort out these children. Like let's give them some of the tech interview questions I have. Maybe they're saying like, this is what capitalism gets you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she's a capitalist. <laughs> No, I think that's perfect. She's a ruthless CEO with a tech background. So this is, you know, how she decides. Yeah. <laughs> so for anyone who hasn't gone through tech interviews, like you're not missing anything. <laughs> Don't, I mean, like computer science is a great field to be in, but interviewing for it is terrible. Uh, but I mean, the that section and the whole like false alarm section, like really was one of my, I wouldn't say favorite, but it really stuck in my mind. Um, you know, just mm-hmm. like the, the imagery of like all the rich people like running to their ships and just incinerating all the poor people who are like trying to like grab onto yeah, the ship. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, it kind of seems that's what's happening. I mean, the get into current state of politics, it seems that's happening in Do Afghanistan it. right now, right? Like we have those images sure. of the of the Afghanis like hanging on to the the bombers, uh, like leaving the Kabul airport. Yeah. I don't know if you remember like back in the Vietnam War, like in Saigon, when we were just mass evacuating as yeah. many people as possible and landing them on like, you know, helicopters would take off because they could land on US naval bases, like literally just out in the middle of the ocean. There's some barge you can land on. And yeah. so many people are crammed into these helicopters and even more people are there on the landing base that eventually they start pushing these like 
top of the line Apache helicopters, like multi million dollar US tech projects into the sea. Yeah. Like just to fit more people. So I think that's a perfect way to connect what's happening right now in Afghanistan to like relatively modern history. So getting into spoiler territory, was this foreshadowing a non false alarm that happens when people have to evacuate or is this just kind of a standalone event? I would say this does foreshadow. Yeah, this does foreshadow because when, if you really want to be spoiled, when the real (laughs) alert does come, like when the dark forest strike does come, I mean, it's the same GD thing all over again. People are just fleeing even when there's no escape possible. Like people, they talk about people trying to flee when they like don't even have life support on their ships so it's literally just like choosing to die in a ship instead of choosing to die at home and they still run and the part where they get mad when they realize that like the ship that that chung and a have has light speed on it <laughs> and they're like, they're like take it down oh, like yeah they try chilling. to crash into them yeah so yeah it's because it's, Cause very it's similar. just it's inequality again it's inequality before death which is the worst kind like people are yeah. sick seeing bezos and branson up in spaceships that's inequality, and this is inequality because one person gets to live, and the other so, don't. So, so does is Chang Shin okay with using light speed to get away, or because she doesn't seem like she seems like she says no to everything? So I'm surprised she she isn't, um, oh. but no, she kind of gets she gets, gets surprised with it. <laughs> so no one knows she, that yeah. like she oh, has a light speed it. ship and she's she's on it, and then um, she meets up with Luaji. And then Laji is like, oh, by the way, your ship has light speed on it. You should get out of here. <laughs> and they're like, but no, yeah. yeah, we're gonna come back for you. He's like, you better not come back here. I think even AA at that point is like, all right, turn around. We'll come get you. And yeah, she's like, how can they be you're so responsible by not putting two men on the ship with us, right? Oh, that was hysterical too. She was yeah. just like straight to Noah's Ark, like, we gotta have two men and two women. <laughs> right. Well, they always portray AA as sort of like being uh, you know, more flirtatious and, and out there. So <laughs> probably like that. It's a combination of like flirtatious and practical for sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it's I guess it is 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 foreshadowing and especially like the classist kind of element. It is weird that like Chung Shin like does get out of the the universe uh and it's kind of mm-hmm. elitist because of it. She's like her and AA are the only people, only two people who get out mm-hmm. of the the universe out of the people who are currently in the, the solar system. It was a really good question about whether that's foreshadowing. That's why I'm here, Talia. <laughs> I will for, I will forget this by next episode, though, so don't worry. Well, it happens next episode, so. Oh, okay. We won't for, oh, maybe you'll forget. I don't know. <laughs> Speaking of uh, Chung Shin and AA, another moment that sticks in sticks in my mind for this book and this series is the kind of the silent moment between um, Chung Shin and AA when they discover a coverage of propulsion, and that's been called back like a bunch of times, right? Like you remember, like the Battle of Darkness, like they speak wordlessly, and you know they're mm-hmm. kind of doing it again here. Like there's like there's so many instances. Yeah, definitely, they have like a whole long conversation. Yeah, like it seems like they're like humanity is like kind of evolving, even though Chung Shin's a, a common era person, like she's still evolving. And AA is like a modern era person. So they're able to like have all these conversations like wordlessly. Like I don't, I couldn't, uh, how that, how would you use your eyes to say curvature propulsion, right? But, but I thought like the, the whole scene was really, I don't know. I really like that scene where they're worried about the Sofan seeing it and they're worried about Tian Bing's safety, but they're trying to like, yeah. trying to like tamp down their excitement over like their realization of like this groundbreaking technology. I, I just, I just love that scene. Yeah, I think we've all had the experience of like telling someone some really exciting news. And we've also had the experience of needing to like bite your tongue and not spoil something, whether you like know something about someone or know something at work before other people. And in this scene, they have to do both. They have to talk about it and hold it back. So there's definitely some tension. It's in balance. That's the whole experience of the main show, me being excited about talking about stuff and not being able to do. <laughs> yeah, especially with you and Priya on at the same time. Just like, <laughs> I don't know if you guys can wordlessly talk yet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> talk, yeah, it's very difficult to to not spoil the fairy tales when I'm so excited about them. So I just played dumb. Yeah, so the next thing I want to talk about is, uh, so, uh, you know, I've mentioned this a bunch of times that I'm on the Reddit constantly for everybody trying to find information uh, and theories and ideas and whatever that I found someone just just yesterday posted the their review of the series and I thought it was pretty interesting and it's interesting because they have a totally different take than me and I think Talia too but 
you can speak to your own. This person did not speak about it with kind of contempt that we'd normally see for people who don't like Death's End. Usually when people don't like Death's End, it's because like, oh, Chen Jing sucks. She is, you know, she's a terrible person and weighs the, weighs the best and that kind of thing. He, he wasn't like, this person wasn't like that. So that that is why it's more interesting. So long story short, like they say uh, that the three body problem, uh, here's a quote, uh, Yeonwoo Jie dooming humanity with her cold response, do not answer, do not answer, do not answer, was my favorite scene in the book. It's left me in shock as would a human and alien civilization would conversate in first contact. Totally agreement there. I love that part. Like that is the part that stick out to me probably the most of uh, of three body problem. And then the dark forest commentary was that uh, I could not trust anything a character would say or do, or we'll never fully inside any of their minds. It made the book a oh, non yeah, non nonstop page turner for me. So yeah, totally. Like, and the interesting thing is, like, they say that they like the first half of the book more than the second half of the book, which is really strange because, yeah, I was like Zhang Bei Hai being like mysterious. Yeah, I, I I don't think I've heard anybody say like the first half of Dark Forest being a page turner. If anything, like everyone talks about how slow it is, how plot you know kind of plods I mean, along. Can you and like, weigh in yeah. on that? Yeah, I was surprised by that as well because I, I I guess yeah, I was surprised that by that as well because I didn't think it was necessarily building that much suspense. But I'm wondering if part of that is because I knew more. Like I. I had a sense of what was going to happen next. So mm. um, I don't know, but I'm, I am surprised at that as well. All right. Well, let's see what they had to say about Death's End then, because I kind of agree with their, their first two points. They're unusual, but I, I definitely see yeah, yeah. Dao Li has, has a point. Uh, so for Death's End, they say, uh, Wade and Chang Chin's opposing ideals felt like it needed more development for me to care about their actions. Uh, I felt the end to be bleak, but appropriate. So, I disagree, especially with the end part. And I think this is sort of a, I see this sentiment a lot, like people taking the end of death's end to be bleak or sad or like dour. I, I don't see that at all. Like I always took it as, you know, Chung Shin and Guan Fan like leave the pocket universe to explore the universe and with the hope that all the other people in the pocket universes will return their matter. And then the universe Very will be able to helpful. reset. But in the in the meantime, like they're able to go out, they have their ship, they're able to go out and explore the universe, like in this weird, yeah. crazy time, you know, millions of years into into their future. I'm just wondering if they specified in their post where they drew the line for the end, because one thing that was my experience reading Death's End for the first time was that I thought we were at the end like four different times. Like yeah. <laughs> the dooming of humanity. I'm like, this is the end. An escape for two people. I thought that was the end. A new universe. I thought that was the end. And like, still, it's not the end until they leave the pocket universe. So, are you, yeah, taking it to be like you know the honest actual end? Yeah, I, that's how I took it. But who knows, right? Mm, like, okay. it, it didn't, didn't specify. Okay. Yeah, and the, the, there's definitely bleak parts of the book, right? Like when, uh, w yeah, that the solar system is you know two dimensionalized, but it, it's actually. Even after the end of the next part, after part five, like it's still kind of hopeful because even though the solar system is two dimensionalized, you know we have this 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 uh, oh. hope of Chungshin and AA being you know exploring the galaxy. I don't think it's bleak because the solar si system is two dimensionalized. I think that they're saying it's bleak because of the reason that that happens, and the reason yeah. that that happens is because people are willing to use the laws of physics as weapons. And people are also willing to live in a world of one fewer dimension just for victory and war. And that is a very bleak, very dark thought. That's true. Yeah. I mean, and the world, the world that they go to, you know, talking about like where, where they're like worried about giving away their coordinates and like they're, they're worried about like just being exposed and like just the mm, nature of yeah. the dark forest, like being, it's a more imposing figure. I think in the, in the end of the book here, where it's like seems even more dangerous, like, in the rest of the book, it's like, well, the dark forest strike is like kind of an abstract thing that like might happen later and might be a problem, but who knows how many hundreds of years in the future. But this is like, mm -hmm. in the end of the book, it seems like a more of an immediate thing. Like if you expose your coordinates, like it's, you know, it's a, it's a social faux pas to do that because you're going to get probably killed almost immediately. 
Well, when you have the ability to act on threats, when you have the ability to shield yourself and the ability to threaten others, it has to be a more pressing concern. And I know we'll talk yeah. a little bit more about how do you shield yourself. But to this Redditor's point, I mean, I kind of see where they're coming from. It could use more development for the relationship between Wade and Chung Sheen and their opposing ideals. I mean, it's hard to argue that. Yeah, this is a question that came up on the the main show too. And this is a question I have for Talia. Like the part where Wade actually like delivers on this promise, right? Chung Sheen doesn't believe that he's going to do it, but he does it. Mm. But I don't think that's really been established why he would do that. It seems more in character that he wouldn't. Like he, it seems more of his character that he would just press forward no matter what, like even despite his promise. Mm. The only thing that it's really holding him to his word is that you know, he is in the military, I guess, right? And like military people yeah. are more honorable, but like that's not a big defining characteristic of him. His defining characteristic that he pushes forward, you know, no matter what. So do you think that needed more development? Did that bother you? It didn't until now. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Spoiling the book in different ways. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah, I mean, you bring up a good point. Military honor, if that's being used, they need to talk about that more earlier. When I think when she asks about his past, he like laughs at her and is like, you know, don't talk about the past. So yeah. if that's the reason that he keeps his promise, yeah, we, I need more. Yeah, it would have been good to see like, you know, an, like a smaller scale representation of that earlier on, right? Like mm, maybe during yeah, the staircase exactly. program, like, you know, no matter what, he keeps his word, like something like that. Yeah, exactly. But in the staircase program, all you see is like Wade just like pushing forward, and, you know, going going against all odds and getting it done because, you well, know, he, he knows. I guess maybe if like Chung Sheen, um, if he was in her debt and she wanted to like just something small, like promise me that you'll send these seeds. And then yeah. she could go into hibernation and wake up and find out, you know, it was his decision to send them. Because we don't actually know whose decision it was to include them. We just see him taunting her like he's not going to be a person. They're going to keep him in a jar. Like there's no point to this. So I think that would actually be a really good example. Like if he didn't agree with the decision, like sending the seeds, but he was honor bound and he does it anyway. That's a good, I like that. Yeah. That's a, that's a really good suggestion. Yeah. So, something small like that, right. Where it kind of plants in your mind, like, Oh, you know, no matter what is, you know, he's going to press forward, but at the end of the day, like his promise is still like the most important thing to him. Yeah. That, that's, that's a, that's a really good suggestion. And as far as motivations go, and we talked about this in the main show is I also don't understand why Cheng Xin would agree to let him take over after he threatened to kill her, basically. I, I thought that part of the character development was also flimsy, I'll say. I'll agree that it's flimsy, but I think there's more there than than the, uh, than yeah, the former. Yeah, that's more forgivable. <laughs> yeah. I, th I think because like, you know, she's talked about like, you know, common era men and, you know, common era people and, and like notices like a lot about the the current world, the, the current era people being kind of soft hearted or, or what have you. Adversity makes strange bedfellows. So right, right. They're in an unusual world. And now, you know, they now they get to work together. I, I like it. Like Dan said, that's more there's more evidence for it. I think if she hadn't got uh, approval from AA, she probably wouldn't have done it. But AA is like, of course, you should do that. So, so like, she knows, like, oh, you're not going to be able to do it because it's against the law. It's against <laughs> humanity or whatever. Um, so give it to somebody who can do it. And he is the kind of person, you know, he pushed, <laughs> he pushed for the Sierra case program against all odds, right? So what's to say he can't also push light speed through against all odds? Uh, I mean, does that, so does that, I, I guess, does that explanation help your understanding at all or sway you at all? And then, that there's a little bit more evidence in the that that way. Maybe a little bit more, but I still think it's flimsy. I'll agree that's flimsy. Like yeah, yeah definitely. Mm -hmm. It's it was it's surprising because it's not expected, right? But then yeah. as you think about it more, it's like, well, I guess so. Like I guess like that she she can't trust anybody else with something as important as to her as Lightspeed. That's a good way to tie it up. She can't trust anyone yeah. else. So I saw another interesting uh, thing, uh, just kind of randomly. It has nothing to do with three body problem or, or death end or anything. But I saw this article on uh, on Twitter that someone posted, and, and it kind of fits in in the scientific means. And it especially reminded me of the the story of Gao Wei, where they had built the space city around the manufacturer black hole. This scientific paper 
uh, posits whether they could build a Dyson sphere around a black hole. So for listeners, the Dyson sphere is basically this like mechanical structure you put around that's supposed to be around a star to harvest its energy. And it's sort of supposed to be one of the hallmarks of like a, an advanced civilization to be able to do that. Like a type two civilization or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you watch Star Trek Next Generation, there's an episode where they actually encountered a Dyson sphere. It's called Relics. It has the one with a the Scotty in it. So you can watch that, give you an explanation. But anyway, the scientific paper posits like, well, could we or, or could somebody build a Dyson sphere around a black hole and and also get as much energy out of that than they could a star? And you and then you can do it in a much smaller like because obviously a black yeah, it's hole. It's more is, economical. It's much smaller. Yeah. So. The paper is super technical and super scientific, and I kind of just skimmed it. <laughs> I looked at the beginning, and I looked at some of the graphs, and looked at the numbers, and <laughs> looked at the end. But basically, the conclusion is, uh, they say, we discuss and conclude that the collectible energy from the CMB is at present is, by the inverse Dyson sphere, it would be too low. Uh, on the other hand, an accretion disk, corona, and relative, relativistic jets could be potential power stations for a type two civilization. Our results suggest that for a stellar mass black hole, even at a low Eddington ratio, the accretion disk would provide hundreds of times more luminosity than a main sequence star. Overall, a black hole can be a promising source is more efficient than harvesting from the main sequence star. So it seems like it is possible. So that's, yeah, like that just reminded me of this uh, section. And I know, Talia, I think you and I talked about the Galway section before, and I think you would like that. We can talk about that more. But that just sort of uh, kind of builds on this idea of building some structure around a, a black hole. So the black hole in this case for Galway was only the size of like a really small moon. Yeah, so it's not it's not stellar mass or you know size, but it's still kind of analogous, I think. Yeah, for those who aren't familiar with what Dan and I were saying about type two civilization, that's a category from the Kardashev scale for measuring a civilization's technological advancement. And a type one civilization is planetary, so it can use all the energy on its planet. A type two civilization, which would be the only, would be like the minimum requirement for building something like a Dyson sphere, no matter what was around, is a stellar civilization. So it can use and control energy at the scale of its entire planetary system. So that's what we're referring to in the, by saying type two civilization. Uh, for people who are interested, Earth is currently estimated at a 0.7. So mm. not even type one. That's higher than I expected. <laughs> Since the thing is that we can't even get past our moon uh, with uh, with people. <laughs> yeah, yes. maybe it's on a curve. Yeah. <laughs> What's the, uh, do you remember what a type three civilization is? Yes, I do. It's a galactic civilization, which can control energy at the scale of its entire host galaxy. So that would be oh. pretty godlike to us yeah. because there's a pretty big, giant leap in between one star and all like the entire milky way so i would say right. as vast as the difference between us and a dyson sphere civilization there's an even bigger gap between stellar and galactic would you agree with that definitely it's yeah beyond ex- <laughs> exponential growth there like, it's it godlike I, I can't even imagine <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I wonder if anyone in this series is even considered to be a type 3 civilization. Yes, because... I I don't think so. We're alluded to. We may not ever see them, but people like cosmologists who are considering the cosmos as a whole, they have to consider that in 16 billion years, these civilizations have existed. Even if there's only one or two, they have Mm. existed. And that's a godlike civilization that can do something as brutal as, like, lower the dimensions of the entire universe. That's true. And like at the very end, like there seem to be people who are aware of the nature of the universe collapsing or expanding. And so maybe they are aware of it because they have knowledge of the entire universe. Yeah. If we want to spoil like the very end for a mean, when they're hiding in their pocket universe, Sophon is telling them like, basically you're never going to get a message ever again, because the amount of energy it would take to send a message would be equivalent to like, exploding an entire galaxy it would be like not like exploding the entire milky way would be enough to send one message and that's sort of dangled and then towards the very end of that segment they do get a message so we're supposed to understand that the cost of them receiving this message is an entire galaxy has been wiped out and they get a message in like a million 
billion different languages. <laughs> mm-hmm. so it's not just like some small, like, you know, Morse code message. It's like message in right. a yeah, lot it's pretty of different sophisticated. Languages. Yeah. <laughs> well, they can only do it once. So if you're, yeah. it can't be reissued, but we'll get to that because there's a lot of interesting stuff in what you mentioned about Dyson spheres around black holes and Gao Wei. I mean, I, I did really like that segment because again, it just felt like a little miniature version. I don't know if you agree with me of the fairy tales where someone mm. is telling a story about a new character and he lives and dies in that story. And then like, we're back out of it. Yeah. I, I, I like that part. I was actually a little bit worried if, uh, if, if Tim and Amin were going to like it, but it seemed like you guys both did like it because it is an aside and has, it's, not really story impactful other than it's kind of world building. Like there's not much, Mm. not much happens because of it, but it's just like, it's a cool extrapolation of what happens when they're trying to develop this technology and like ways that like people need that scientists would do to um, can further the research and like how one scientist in particular Mm. gives his life to, (laughs) to, uh, uh, to the study of it. Definitely. I mean, lots of scientists have given their lives, not always voluntarily, to their creations, just look at Jurassic Park, a documentary <laughs> about scientists. In Gao Wei, I do think it is a collision of society and technology again, because when you become a civilization that's able to manufacture a black hole, suddenly you have to think about things like whose time perspective counts when we're talking about death. And that is... I mean, that does happen later because when you are a civilization that can produce light speed ships, then you have a lot of, you know, you have to consider things that I think Guan Fen says are like, they used to be the realm of philosophers and now every normal person has to consider their place in between now and the heat death of the universe. So I thought it mattered. <laughs> but what did Tim and Amin have to say? I thought it was a good story. I don't know. I guess I wasn't sure how it mattered necess- specifically, but I thought the story itself was interesting. Again, mostly because I don't care much about Cheng Shin and her whole plot, so so <laughs> anything else is interesting. So as an aside, like you know, you, you've mentioned that before. Um, do you actively dislike her, or you just don't care about like what happens to her personally? No, I don't dislike her. I just, I just don't think that she is very often in ha, plays an active role in anything. I think her whole demeanor is I'm going to let other people do it, or I'm just going to say no and stop anything from happening. Um, I guess saying no to everything is, is taking some action, but it's not really that interesting of a, of a character to me anyway. It's fair. Yeah, I mean, a lot, I ask because a lot of people like actively hate her. <laughs> so <laughs> like, and I, you know, I don't fully get it. And people like, it's always like, you know, Wade versus Chung Shin or whatever. It's like, it's dumb. Yeah. So the next thing I want to talk about is just kind of more of the practical effects of the black domain. I thought it was an interesting question that came up on the, the main show as well, both because I think it's an interesting thing. And Tim specifically brought up the effects of computers in the, mm. uh, in the black domain. And we see that in like a very practical way. So that's <laughs> what I mean again, physically the uh, Chung Shin and um, and Guan Yifan get get stuck in a, a curvature of propulsion uh, line, and it acts like a black domain. And so, like the time kind of like, spins out of control for them. But the yeah. the thing is, like the light it goes at a very small uh, or very slow speed, uh, and so they're not able to use their normal computers. They have to use like a sp- special kind of computer that's built like around like a neurological net or something to actually work and it takes a really long time for it to work so they actually have to like mini hibernate for a little while where they're like trying to get the the computer back online so it's it's a really practical effect of computers not working in reduced light speed black hole so definitely so the effect of that in the real world if they were to have done that um would be that like yeah computers basically would stop working as they currently do. Yeah, it reminded me of the first book in Three Body where they're playing the video game and they have these soldiers like holding up flags and, you yeah. know, shout out to, you know, Computer Science 101. I mean, that's how you build a logic <laughs> gate. That's yeah. correct. And I think someone even comments like, oh, this is too slow. Like I tried it with my coworkers in the office and it was so slow. And then it's revealed like, what if you could communicate at the speed of light? 
Yeah. Because like hint, hint, that's how Trisolaris can communicate. But literally think about if your computer processor ran at the speed of like people holding up flags, yes and no. I mean, imagine if you had to hibernate to wait for your computer to boot up. Right. <laughs> it's very practical. That's what happens, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, if I remember right, they they say like all the stuff in the three body problem, a three body world was sort of eh, sort of artistic liberty, except for the computer part. They really did that, <laughs> but they do it. They do it because the yeah the trisolarians communicate their thoughts via via light. So that obviously wouldn't work in a reduced light speed black hole uh, either. Mm-hmm. So yeah, so I wonder what other practical effects we would see. I mean. The, the one passage I took from the book, they, they talked about it. They said, uh, this is after they left the, the, the maelstrom. Uh, it says, the helicopter continued above the clouds. It was now after 11 p.m. The sun slowly set in the west, leaving only a slice visible. In the golden light of the midnight sun, everyone tried to imagine a life in a world where the light moved just below 16.7 kilometers per second. Tried to imagine that the creeping light of such a sunset. So yeah, like the world wow. is like, look way different right like the sunset and like the light would come slowly at you rather than just like the light being on you so like what does that even look what how can people experience that right so are there any other practical effects you guys can think of that the slowness of light would would sort of impede or just change or well i mean just having been born on the earth you know myself 16 billion (laughs) years after the big bang it's like hard to imagine light being any faster because it's the fastest thing in the universe in the known universe. Yeah. But what is, you know, gestured to when they talk about light slowing down is also light speeding up. And in fact, it used to be faster, right? So they would look at how we're living right now and try to imagine like, Oh my God, how could they live with light only going 300 kilometers per second? So I don't know if this is a practical effect of the black domain, but you know, if you're, traditional Chinese historian, this is practical. The black domain idea is very Taoist. And I can explain that a little bit. The rhetoric of Taoism actually extends past what you may have learned about, you know, the way the Tao in college of like, find the way. And the greatest Taoist philosophers actually extend this to make them stupid, talking about the people and nourish their bones. That's from semi-legendary Chinese figure Lao Tzu. And that's the exact scenario of humanity. If they were to be sealed inside a black domain, like nourish their bones, all their needs would be met in this like paradise world and they're safe forever. But if you just think about being sealed in, people looking in on this fate would like kind of shudder. They're never able to leave. Their light is so slow. They have no neighbors, no stories. And that's like the Taoist envisioning of how life should be so that's very practical but yeah (laughs) shivers yeah he was one of the figures in the three body world so yeah maybe maybe that's where he got the idea of a black domain was from this this kind of philosophy yeah that's that's Uh, i mean he's not as famous as confucius but he's like almost as famous so chinese readers have heard of lao tzu right (laughs) All right. Well, uh, anything else you guys want to talk about before we wrap it up? Listen to the main show. It was really good this week. <laughs> and after all the hype, I'm very excited for our next episode. Um, singer, whatever that means. Mm. You'll find out right away. <laughs> whatever that re- means indeed. Yeah. And speaking of next episode, um, I've been in contact with our common uh, commenter, Frank, and he will be joining us for the main show next time. So look forward to that. Speaking of the next episode, thanks for listening to this episode of the spoiler cast of Rehydrate. Leave us comments by emailing rehydrate at fastmail.com or on Twitter at RehydratePod. Please join us next episode for Season 5, Episode 6, Singer, all of Part 5 of Death's End by Liu Sushin.